Hello, and welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. When I had the idea to do an episode looking at three books, I wanted to use those books as a jumping-off point to look at the influence that those books had on the world around them. However, considering the topic that we're going to talk about today, that was really just an impossibility. The book that we're going to be talking about today is so important, not just in its influence, but as a source material that really to try and lump it in with any other books would do it an injustice. In fact, today, we're going to look exclusively at this book, and we're not even going to begin to get through it. This book, if we were to talk about its influence, single-handedly started Europe's love affair with pirates and piracy. It's the only source on most of the pirates in this generation, and it took men who would have otherwise been entirely unknown throughout the world and made them famous, or at least infamous. This book went on to make the author uh, quite a wealthy man who had quite a bit of renown of his own. The book we're going to be talking about today is The Buccaneers of America by Alexander Exquimelin. This is episode number 16, Three Books, Part 2. Now, in The Buccaneers of America, the author himself, Alexander of Squimelin, is a character as well. He's not just the narrator, he plays a role in what's happening in several parts, and he's there all throughout it. So we should look at Exquimelin himself a little bit. Now, as with nearly all of the figures we talk about, his original European origins are unknown. He was probably born in France, but it's also likely that he was Dutch or Flemish. We really don't know, and people from all of these regions argue about exactly where he came from. What we do know of the author, especially in his early life, before he became a household name, is what he told us himself. In the beginning of the book, he tells us that in the year 1666, he sailed as an indentured servant with the Dutch West India Company, which is why many people believe him to be Dutch. The fleet he sailed with was large and multinational. There were somewhere around 30 ships and only a couple of warships, and he goes into some detail on the crossing. He talks about the possibility for meeting pirates in certain areas, how the warship went and chased after a known pirate ship that had been spotted just off the coast and failed to capture them. And then he goes into quite a bit of detail about a couple of initiation rituals that he had to go through along with some of the other passengers. He calls them baptisms, and the way that they're performed does kind of mirror a baptism. The first of these baptisms takes place as they pass a place called the Race, which was a narrow and rocky passage that was, assumedly, somewhere that was dangerous for ships to pass. And if you were someone who had never gone through the Race before, you had to undergo this little baptism. They had a man, the bosun, dress up in kind of a strange costume that mirrored a priest, maybe? He wore a long sackcloth robe, and he had a necklace on that was made out of all sorts of ship's tackle. And in one hand, he had a bucket of tar, some of which he had slathered all over his face, and on the other hand, he had a wooden sword. Now, each of the people who had not passed through the race before had to kneel before the bosun. When they did, he, with one of his fingers dipped in the tar, drew a cross on their forehead, and then hit them on the back of the neck with his sword. After this, the rest of the crew would dump seawater on the people who were being baptized. And then, with their sins washed away, they would get incredibly drunk. However, not on the ship's wine, the people who had never made this voyage before had to bring brandy and wine of their own that would be drunk up at this ceremony, and everybody had a grand old time on their wine. Now, there was another initiation that happened when you passed the Tropic of Cancer that was a little bit more terrifying. You had to hang from one of the masts on the ship over the water and willfully drop yourself into the water. Now, you weren't required to do this, but if you refused to do so, you had to pay, depending on your station, either one or two pounds silver. Exquimelin says about these initiation rituals, quote, Nobody from either nation can give the reasons for doing these things, apart from its being an old tradition among the seamen. Some say that the matter was so ordained by the Emperor Charles V, but it is not to be found in his Book of Laws. Having in passing described these ceremonies of the sailors, we will now continue our voyage. End quote. Now, all of the ships in this fleet were headed to different locations. A few of them were headed to Newfoundland, some of them were headed to Plymouth, some of them to Bermuda. Most of them were headed to the Caribbean, but the ship that Alexander Exquimelin was on was headed to a very particular little island 
called Tortuga. Now, the next two or three chapters of Exquimelin's book are dedicated almost entirely to describing the flora and fauna of a place like Tortuga and the coast of Hispaniola nearby. This might seem somewhat excessive to you, and it did to me reading it the first time, but I realized that this is something that the people in Europe would have no notion of. This would be like somebody traveling to Mars and writing about whatever they were seeing there. This was somebody who made it to the New World, something that most of the people in Europe were never able to do, sending a report back to them to tell them all about the sights and the sounds and really set the stage that they were to find themselves in. You and I, we've all seen video or pictures of the Caribbean, if we haven't been there ourselves, but for the people in Europe, this was an entirely alien world, and Exquimelin really wanted to set the stage as much as possible. Now this couple of chapters also discusses the locals on the island of Tortuga, the men who had lived there for some time, those people who hunted boar or chopped timber, those people who used the old native cooking custom as the bucan, those people that would be known as the buccaneers. Exquimelin goes into some detail about the conflict between Spain, France, England, and the Netherlands over this tiny little island of Tortuga. And that's actually one of the few things in the early part of his book that can be corroborated. See, there are records kept by the great powers in Europe of this conflict, so we know what exactly Exquimelin tells us that's true, and what of it is not true. Many of the things they heard here were second-hand, because this happened long before Exquimelin came to the Caribbean, even before he was born. But he gets the gist of it right. Some of the names, some of the dates aren't exactly correct, but he gets essentially what happens there at least on the road to being right. So that can give us an indication that Exquimelin knows what he's talking about, even if he doesn't get all of the facts exactly correct. But that's something that's a major problem with the Buccaneers of America. Alexander Exquimelin speaks with the authority of somebody that was there, that has first-hand knowledge, but when there are sources of evidence that come from other places, usually the Spanish who kept excellent records, they almost always contradict what Alexander Exquimelin told us. So we have to take everything he said with a grain of salt. Unfortunately, for so much of what we're going to be talking about, there are no other sources about it. There are going to be pirates in this story that he's going to go into some detail talking about that don't appear anywhere else in any other narrative. There are no other records of these people, so they may be complete fabrications of his imagination. Now, they probably weren't. The things that we know he talked about turned out to be mostly true, but we have to assume that since we can't find any other proof that... They're not exactly historical fact. You see, part of the problem is that Alexander Squimelin was working off of eyewitness accounts, or at least the tales told by some pirate he met in a tavern. See, he didn't have access to court records or the governor's mansion in any of these places. He merely had to talk to people who were there who hopefully knew what they were talking about. But we can't know any more than he did whether or not these people were telling accurate tales. To give a picture of these contradictions that we can't exactly know if they're true or not, I'll give an example. After Alexander Exquimelin is freed from his indentured servitude, and then after he goes on at some length about how indentured servitude is so much worse than slavery, he goes on to say, quote, When I was free once more, I was like Adam when he was created. I had nothing at all, and therefore resolved to join the privateers or buccaneers, with whom I stayed until the year 1670, accompanying them on many various voyages and taking part in many important raids, as I shall describe later on in this account. End quote. He then goes on to tell us of the first buccaneer on Tortuga, the first man who raided from the island. The man's name is, as Exquimelin records it, Pierre Legrand, and he tells us of Legrand's greatest success. Pierre was at sea in a small bark, little more than an open rowboat, and things weren't going well for him. His ship was in such poor repair that it was barely seaworthy, and all of the men with him were going hungry. They had no food and little water. They were just out there in the ocean, searching for prey, unable to find anything and baking in the hot Caribbean sun. As his men scanned the horizon, finally, one day they saw it, a lone ship, just sails in the distance. Legrand sailed his small bark towards the ship. Clearly, it was a Spanish merchant vessel that had become separated from its convoy and didn't have any protection out on the high seas. So as night fell, Legrand ordered his men to board the vessel. He told them that the Spanish aboard were unprepared for an attack and unlikely to repel them, although he did say that they have, at worst, a 50-50 chance. 
He had his men swear an oath of loyal endeavor, and then Legrand ordered the ship's carpenter to bore a hole in the ship's hull, allowing it to sink as they boarded the other vessel. This emboldened the men who were with him because they knew that they had to take this ship or they had nothing to escape to and nowhere to go. It was either take this ship or face prison or death. Each of his men, armed with a cutlass and, if they were lucky, a pistol with maybe one shot, they came up on the side of the vessel, climbed aboard her silently on their bare feet, and moved across the deck. They scanned the deck and saw that no guard had been posted. They were able to move around the deck freely. But as they moved below deck, they heard laughter and raucous conversation. Each of these pirates drew their sword and their pistol, if they had one. Then the pirates burst into the captain's cabin, where there were a number of men sitting around the table playing cards. The pirates moved so quickly that they didn't have a chance to react, many of the men probably still holding their cards or their mugs of ale. Suddenly they had a cutlass to their throat, and the captain had a pistol clapped against his chest. Legrand ordered the captain to surrender his ship. The captain must have thought quickly, thinking if there was any hope of repelling these pirates, when he heard a sudden report coming from the arms chamber. The smile on the Grand's face told him that the men in the arms chamber had been taken, the ship belonged to the pirates, and the captain had no choice but to surrender. The crew of the small vessel was led on board and clapped in irons. As they looked around, they saw surrounding the ship nothing but empty ocean. There was no way that these pirates could have boarded their vessel, unless, as the captain assumed, they were demons sent from the sky. He was said to have said, quote, Jesus son demonios estos, end quote. Apparently, his men, the captain's men, had warned the captain that those sails off in the very, very far distance might have been pirate sails, but the captain said that he needn't fear of such a small vessel, and so he didn't order any special watch to go on deck. This, of course, sealed his fate. Now, after dropping off the crew on land as quickly as they could get to it, Legrand took his new boat, and he sailed all the way to France, never to be seen on the high seas again. Now, that's the end of the account given by Exquimelin, but this raises some questions for me. How exactly would Exquimelin have any knowledge of an attack at sea that happened in the year 1602? This was some 40 years before Exquimelin himself was even born. Now, Exquimelin said that he got this story from the journal of a, quote, trustworthy man, but it's just as likely that this was something of a creation myth, that the buccaneers on Tortuga told of how they began their raiding. The one man, Le Grand, Pierre the Great, who showed everybody on the island exactly how they could fight the Spanish and make a whole lot of money in the process. Now, Pierre Legrand is one of those pirates that there is no other account of. This is the only source on him at all. The only source anywhere else in the world that carries somebody around the right time that sort of matches his description comes from harbor records. A man named Pierre came into this harbor that apparently came from the same place that Legrand claimed to be from, although he didn't call himself Legrand there, he used his given name. But this didn't happen in France which is what Exquimelin tells us, this happened up in Canada. So in the one place that potentially we can corroborate some part of this story, it's actually incorrect. So we have to take this story not exactly at face value. It might not be true at all. But since we have no evidence to disprove it, we just sort of have to accept that this is the story that the man who is the source for all of these pirates we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, this is just a story that he decided to tell us, so we have to at least accept that it was something that the pirates at the time believed. Now, after talking about the origin of the buccaneers on Tortuga, Exquimelin goes on to talk about several of the other well-known buccaneers of the time. He talks about a Dutchman, a couple of Englishmen. He goes on to talk at length about a French pirate who was very active in the area, who we will talk about later. But this all happened after Exquimelin arrived in the Caribbean in 1666. When we left our story off last time, Pin and Venables had just taken the island of Jamaica in the year 1655. Now, we mentioned a couple of times last time that on board that voyage, one of the soldiers in Oliver Cromwell's Western design was a young man named Henry Morgan, which, of course, is the prime subject of Alexander Exquimelin's work. He goes into great deal about his time with Henry Morgan, so we're going to look at some of that. But 
If you try to look at it in a narrative flow from the year 1655, when Morgan arrived in the Caribbean, the puzzle isn't exactly complete. Exquimelin writes in his introduction to Captain Morgan, quote, Henry Morgan was born in that part of Wales known as Welsh England. His father was a well-to-do farmer, but Morgan, having no liking for farm work, decided to go to sea. He reached a port where ships leave for Barbados and signed on for the voyage. On arrival, he was sold as an indentured servant in the English manor. Having served his time, he went to Jamaica, where he found several buccaneer ships ready to put to sea. He joined the expedition and soon learned their manner of life. After making three or four voyages with the buccaneers, he and his comrades had made enough money out of the loot and dicing to buy a ship of their own. Morgan was made captain, and they went marauding along the coast of Campeche, where they captured several ships. End quote. Now that short paragraph, that brief introduction to the man who would be known as Captain Morgan, is all that Exquimelin writes about the first 25 years of Henry Morgan's life. Even the first six years of his time in the Caribbean, the time that made him Captain Morgan. So today I want to take a long, hard look at that paragraph to fill in some of the gaps and correct some of the inaccuracies. I'd like to do this by taking that paragraph sentence by sentence. Exquimelin begins, quote, Henry Morgan was born in that part of Wales known as Welsh England, end quote. That much is essentially true. Now, I had trouble finding out exactly what he meant by Welsh England. They were, at the time, united, so perhaps that's what he's talking about. But yes, Henry Morgan was born in Wales, probably in the county of Monmouth, although people in Wales argue divisively over where exactly he was from. Exquimelin continues, His father was a well-to-do farmer, but Morgan, having no liking for farm work, decided to go to sea. Now, that is essentially correct in spirit, although there are a couple of pretty serious issues with it. Mostly the fact that it's incomplete. There's a lot more to that story. See, Henry Morgan was the son of a man named Robert Morgan. Now, Robert did own a farm, but neither he or his son actually got their hands dirty tilling the soil. They had many other men working for them to do that work. You see, the Morgan clan was an old and distinguished family. Robert sent his son off to school because he wanted him to become a lawyer. Henry would later say, quote, I left the schools too young and have been more used to the pike than the book, End quote. Now, the people in the part of Wales that Henry came from were renowned across the British Isles for their military prowess. And very little else, the English had a lot of fun at the expense of the Welsh, but they didn't ever take them for granted when it came to their power on the battlefield. And Henry Morgan almost certainly would have learned quite a bit about the pike. You see, he was a teenager during the English Civil War. He probably would have been a little too young to actually serve, but men who were members of his family, both of his uncles, his father's brothers, were involved deeply in the Civil War, on opposing sides, as it turns out. His uncle Thomas was actually somewhat well-known. He was one of the top-ranking officers in Cromwell's new model army. He was kind of the right-hand man to the top general in that army, and Thomas Morgan himself was a decorated war hero and something of a mild celebrity. Now, his other uncle, Edward, would have had quite a bit more influence on the young Henry Morgan. Edward was a colonel in the royalist side of the Civil War, the Cavaliers, and he was posted at a pretty key position there in Wales. Now, Henry Morgan, to say that he was more used to the pike, almost certainly had some experience with them, and this suggests to some historians that likely he served under his uncle, not as a soldier, but as something of a squire or an assistant, or somebody who was essentially just there to help him out and kind of learn the trade. So, Henry Morgan, growing up as a young teenager, would have learned things like siege warfare and artillery and the rudiments of battlefield tactics and how to lead men into battle. Now, as he grew a little bit older, 16, 17 years old, there's a possibility that he even did fight, probably not as a grunt soldier, but somebody who led a small battalion of men, somewhere probably around 10 men. There's no record of that, but it seems quite likely. Now, Exquimelin says that part about how Henry Morgan went to sea, and while that's true, he didn't go to make his fortune on the oceans, he went as part of a military expedition under Penn and Venables. Now, Exquimelin goes on, 
quote, he reached a port where the ships leave for Barbados and signed on for the voyage, end quote. And that, yes, that did happen. That was the voyage of the Western design, Cromwell's plan to take over the Caribbean, and that port was Portsmouth. That much is undeniably correct. Then, Exumelin continues, quote, On arrival, he was sold as an indentured servant in the English manner, end quote. Now that, however, is not true. Now, there is a possibility that Henry Morgan told his men that tale to partially ingratiate himself with them, but that's pretty unlikely. Now, I should note that some historians take this line of Exquimelin's at his word and believe that Henry Morgan was at one point sold as an indentured servant. But then, most historians argue that the evidence proves that this line is just factually inaccurate, and I tend to agree with that side of the argument. You see, Henry Morgan wasn't just some dockside ruffian. What we said last time about what Major Robert Sedgwick said, who is a character we're going to meet in just a little bit, but Major Sedgwick said about that expedition to the Caribbean that they were, quote, so unworthy, so slothful, and basely secure, end quote. And that really doesn't fit the Henry Morgan that comes down to us from history. He, from the Morgan clan, came from a proud tradition of military men, a family that was wealthy enough that Henry, as a young man, as a teenager, had his portrait painted. This portrait is the only painting that still exists of Henry Morgan, and it's the only description that's been given of him physically up until the time right around his death. So, it's the only thing that we have to go on about what Henry Morgan probably looked like, and it shows a boy who's unlikely to have been sold into indentured servitude. The fact that he had a portrait itself is some evidence, but he's wearing rich clothing, ruffles around his neck, he's got a curly, probably a wig, but it may be his natural hair, he's got a, a mischievous smirk, he's dressed kind of like a dandy. You might imagine this kid running around chasing the maids around his father's home when his father wasn't looking. That doesn't sound like what somebody who would be sold into indentured servitude lived their life like, so most historians agree that that bit is totally incorrect. However, there is another possibility. It is possible that Henry Morgan was forced into military service by the government of Oliver Cromwell. You see, if Henry Morgan had served in the Civil War, he would have served on the Royalist side. However, he wouldn't have been just a grunt soldier. He would have been an officer, somebody with a little bit of experience. So, if he had served, it's quite likely that he would have been pressed into service to go across the world, something that nobody from the new model army wanted to do, but they needed some experienced soldiers to keep these ruffians that were going to the Caribbean a little bit in line. Exquimelin, his passage goes on, quote, Having served his time, he went to Jamaica, where he found several buccaneer ships ready to put to sea, end quote. Once again, no, that's not how it happened at all. See, uh, assuming that we agree that he didn't serve his time as an indentured servant, that part just isn't true, and he did go to Jamaica, but he didn't just arrive in Jamaica, he was one of the first Englishmen ever to set foot on the island in that invasion force, so... Instead of finding some buccaneers to put to sea, all he would have found there are a couple dozen poorly defended Spanish plantations. Moving on, quote, He joined the expedition and soon learned their manner of life, end quote. Now this is true. However, there's so much more to this story of how Henry Morgan learned the life of a buccaneer. You see, Henry Morgan's first months in Jamaica, in fact, the lives of all of the men on that expedition, well, they were horrifying. You see, the English had taken that town, the capital of Jamaica, with no fighting at all. But there was far more to come. There was still going to be quite a bit of resistance over the island. So the men, these Englishmen, they had sleepless nights sleeping on the beach. You see, the Spanish soldiers that had been at the garrison there fled into the hills in Jamaica. And while there weren't many of these soldiers left, Jamaica was their home. These soldiers had lived there their entire lives, or at least for many years, and these English soldiers had never been there before. They didn't know the island at all. So the soldiers, naturally, well, they feared attack from the Spanish, coming from an unsuspected direction. However, it wasn't just the Spanish that they had to fear. The Spanish had freed their slaves, who had gone to join up with the communities of Maroons deep in the wilderness that did not want the English there either. So the escaped slaves and their Maroon brethren were fighting against them. And then the Maroons and the Spanish were both allied with the local Taino people, who knew the island even better than the Spanish did, knew all of its nooks and crannies, and 
These three groups, sort of loosely connected allies, led a very successful guerrilla operation against the English. But even when the soldiers were completely safe, they would be sleeping on or near the beach, and they would hear thousands of crabs that were coming ashore. Then the scuttling of these crabs, as recorded, sounded almost exactly like the rattling of cartridges that would be carried on a Spaniard's belt. So they spent all night hoping that it was just the crabs and not the Spanish, unable to sleep because the possibility of attack was so real. So as the men spent their sleepless nights and long, unpleasant days, their stores of food began to dwindle, and all of the men on the expedition started to go hungry. The Spanish had taken a lot of the food with them, destroyed what food they could before they left, and so the Englishmen had almost nothing to eat. Now, Jamaica is, of course, a rich place with lots of wildlife, but hunting on the island, for the Englishmen at least, was a, it was a dicey proposition. You see, many times when people would go hunting for either boar or tortoise, well, if too many men went to go hunt those boar or tortoise, they would scare the animals away. However, if there were too few men going hunting, well, most of those hunting parties that only had a few men with them never returned. The only news that the men back at base camp would have of that hunting party would be the vultures they would see circling in the sky deeper into the island. So the men were going hungry. The men spent their nights consumed by fear, and then, in August, a few months after they had taken the island, Admiral Penn and General Venables, with several hundred of the top officers in the group, well, they set sail and returned to England. It would turn out, as they kind of expected, that Penn and Venables would be thrown into the Tower of London for failing to take Hispaniola. However, that wasn't a concern for Henry Morgan and the other soldiers that were left in Jamaica. The men were all alone, on a foreign island, halfway around the globe from their homes, and they were surrounded by hostile eyes from the tree line, from the Taino, the Maroons, and the Spanish. They were going hungry, and they were growing desperate, and then, as things began to get worse and worse for them, the men began to get sick. The yellow fever and malaria that are still to this day notorious killers of people that are unused to the Caribbean, well, they began to take their toll on the men as they had on Hispaniola on a daily basis. Now, these months have very little record. There was essentially no authority on the island. However, it's likely, given his notoriety and popularity that would crop up almost immediately once records did start taking shape, that Henry Morgan was a leader among these men someone who rallied them and got them what food they could find and organized their defense as best as he could. But there were only about 2,000 men left. And then, even though there weren't that many Spanish soldiers, they didn't know how many natives or how many maroons they were. So this seemed like a pathetically small force. But then, a few months later, after about six months on the island of people dying, going hungry, and living in fear, a ship from England finally arrived there in what was called Cagway Port. The men on the island must have rejoiced. The ship carried the island's new governor, that man we talked about earlier, Major Sedgwick, who, when the operation had left English shores, had said of the men that they, quote, desired rather to die than to live, end quote. He found, when he got to Jamaica, that if that was their wish, it had certainly been granted. The men were dying left and right, and he realized that the Jamaican expedition was in a, a dire situation. So he wrote back to Lord Cromwell, the Lord Protector in England, and he told him, quote, You must, in a manner, begin the work over again. End quote. But Sedgwick did what he could to improve the island. He organized their defenses, and he gave them whatever form of health care he could find. Then he secured hunting and fishing grounds for the men. These were military operations that he used to secure certain tracts of land that had plenty of game on them for the men to eat. And he gave command of what ships they had there in Jamaica to a man named William Goodson. This made him the admiral of what was known and would go on to be known for centuries as the Jamaica Station. Then, in January 1656, the ship called the Marston Moor sailed into harbor, and her captain, a man named Christopher Mings, was named sub-commander of the Jamaica Station. He would go on to be vice-admiral of their fleet there. And then, after about nine months, the island of Jamaica began to take on something resembling civilization. And something that kind of surprised me, but I found really interesting, began to happen. You see, the men who would call Jamaica their home would occasionally be captured by the Spanish. And the Spanish record over and over again that they use the same defense whenever they are being interrogated by their Spanish jailers. They would say 
that it wasn't them acting of their own volition. They were actually under orders from the Jews. You see, no, I'd heard about this before, but I always just kind of chalked it up to being a clever lie. I thought that since probably the only people that the Spanish hated more than the Protestant English were the Jewish people around Europe. Aside from, I guess they probably hated the Arab people in the Middle East more than any of them, but only slightly more than they hated the Jews. However, it turns out that many of these immigrants from Europe, these Jewish immigrants, played a major role in this era of Caribbean piracy. Now, if you recall, way back in the 1490s, after Ferdinand and Isabella took Spain back from the Caliphate of Cordoba, they called an inquisition that aimed to cleanse their realms of any non-Catholics. Now, of course, they targeted thousands, maybe millions of Muslims that were still living on the Iberian Peninsula, but they didn't stop with the Muslims. For years, the Inquisition scoured the lands for any Jewish families that were living there. They whipped up mobs and violent pogroms that would execute or exile any Jews that they found. Now, as you might imagine, most of these exiled Jews, and certainly any that were still living there secretly, well, they fled the country as quickly as possible. Now, most of these people went to Portugal or Germany, many went to the Netherlands, some went to England. However, for a lot of Jewish families, that wasn't far enough. They decided they had to get out of Europe entirely. In fact, they had to get into a different hemisphere. However, they would have still found most of the New World in the early 1500s controlled by the Spanish. Naturally, places like New Spain, which would be modern-day Mexico or terra firma down south a little bit, were just completely out of the question. They were centers of power for the Spanish Empire. Some of the larger islands, places like Cuba or Hispaniola, were almost as solidly in the hands of the Spanish government and not the local planters. However, there was one island just slightly to the southwest of those two that was smaller and had a tiny population, but that was rich and offered them something of an opportunity, and that was Jamaica. Now, to be sure, Jamaica wasn't perfect. There was still a governor and a garrison there, but they had a lot less interference from Europe and from the higher-ups in the Spanish government. So the Jews in Jamaica were able to just keep their heads down, they took to calling themselves Portuguese, and they practiced their religion in private, and nobody bothered them. However, then in 1655, when the English took the island, that man Venables made mention in his journals of a surprisingly large number of Portuguese nationals that had not fled with the Spanish. But when Major Sedgwick came and became governor of the island, he found out the truth, and he was elated. These Jewish people who had stayed in town were locals, people who had lived there their entire lives, sometimes for generations, but locals that he could trust. They weren't Catholics. They were people who hated the Spanish just as much as he did, so they were going to be powerful allies in this fight. He wrote back to Cromwell, and Cromwell made all of the Jewish people on Jamaica officially English citizens, and they were finally able to practice their faith out in the open, just as they were in England. Now, Sedgwick had plans to make use of these locals, but they happily obliged. I mean, can you imagine it? Living in a place at the edge of the world, hiding in the shadows for centuries, and then all of a sudden, a new tolerant government who is at war with your previous overlords shows up? That must seem like a gift from God and something that you are going to make the most use of you possibly can. So, several of the prominent men from their community, along with William Goodson, Christopher Mings, and a few of the higher-up officers, joined a council that was going to help the new governor govern the nation. They had several pretty pressing concerns, the least of them not being the Spanish who were nearby and some of them still on the island. So, this council began to formulate a plan. What it came up with was a two-pronged approach. You might call these two approaches forced trade and a proactive defense. Now, the proactive defense side of that two-pronged attack was essentially sending out ships filled with buccaneers to sweep the oceans clean of any Spanish vessels, be they warships or merchant shipping that they could find. The second part of that two-pronged attack, that forced trade, after the seas were clear and the trade routes that had been controlled for centuries by the Spanish were in the hands of the English, well, they would fill that gap left 
English merchant vessels would show up at many of these ports that were traditionally visited by their Spanish brethren and offer to buy all of the tobacco or coffee or sugar that they had stored up. They would tell them that their Spanish ships weren't coming to pick it up, and if they wanted to sell it, they were going to have to sell to the English. Now, if any of these patriotic Spaniards living in the colonies decided they didn't want to sell to the English, they might just let it know that some of those notorious pirates these people had heard about roving the high seas might just pay their little town a visit. Nearly all of them sold their goods to the English, who then made a huge profit selling them back in England. This dealt a blow not only to the Spanish, who they were at war with, but to the Dutch, who had a monopoly on trade in the Caribbean and who they had been at war with only about two years prior. However, they weren't able to begin this plan immediately. What they needed, they had some ships, not enough, but they didn't have nearly enough men to enact this plan. So some of the locals suggested that this man Ming, and probably some of his top aides, which almost certainly included Henry Morgan, set sail and go to a little island just to the northeast called Tortuga, where they could recruit as many of the buccaneers there as they needed. And it must have been a sweet offer when they got there. Tortuga was a dangerous place that was in the hands of usually the French at this period in time, which was fine by most of them, but it was still contested and deep in Spanish waters. However, this island, Jamaica, it was previously Spanish, but now they had a fort, they had a good harbor, and they had a government, an official English government that was going to do all they could to protect these pirates. A government that would make use of them to be sure, but that these pirates could rely on. At least they had one port, and potentially a series of ports, that would be a friendly empire to them. But before they could begin this plan in earnest, in May their governor, now General Sedgwick, passed away. His replacement, who showed up a few weeks later, passed away almost immediately. So, finally, they appointed a man named General Edward Doyley, who had been there since the 1655 invasion. He had been there the entire time. He was as local as any Englishman in Jamaica got. Now, the new governor's first order of business was to fight off an invasion from those Spanish guerrillas who were living up in the hills. There were two invasions. The first one was bolstered by about 300 Spanish soldiers from the island of Cuba. So there were, in total, somewhere around 400 Spaniards and around 100 native and African guerrillas. But they were fought off pretty easily. However, then another invasion occurred a few months later that was somewhat larger. That one involved some actual fighting. However, with very little loss of life, the English came out on top and the Spanish guerrilla force fled back to Cuba. So, finally... Christopher Mings, along with almost certainly Henry Morgan and several of the other most notorious names to come, set out and began their practice of forced trade and proactive defense, which amounted to little more than piracy on the high seas and raiding any of the Spanish coastal towns that were within their reach. Most of the records about where they actually raided are kept by the Spanish around this time, but it looks like they raided Rio de la Hacha and Santa Marta, along with a few other old favorites. And it was during this time that what Exquimelin said about Captain Morgan learning the ways of the buccaneers during this last few months of 1656 going into 1657, he would have truly learned what it took to be a buccaneer on the Caribbean Ocean. So let's move on with that passage from Alexander Exquimelin. He writes, quote, After making three or four voyages with the buccaneers, he and his comrades had made enough money out of loot and dicing to buy a ship of their own. End quote. This is correct, at least, in spirit. In the year 1659, or maybe 1660, Henry Morgan was finally, it is recorded, captain of his own ship. However, whether he bought it with his own money or took it from a Spanish captain is unclear. However, we do know that in 1660 he did take three ships, which he sold to three of his closest and most trusted friends. The Dolphin, the smallest of those vessels, he sold to his friend John Morris. Robert Searle took the largest, which was an 8-gun, 80-tonner that was called the Cagway, and then his friend John Lawrence bought the Pearl. Oddly, however, we don't know the name of Captain Morgan's own ship at this time. But these four captains, this Captain Morgan, Captain Morris, Captain Searle, and Captain Lawrence, well, they become probably the most popular and maybe the most feared pirates operating in the Caribbean at this time, at least out of the port there on Jamaica. They were men who 
were a terror to the Spanish, but back in port they were extremely popular, lots of fun, and apparently spent their money for other men's pleasure. They ingratiated themselves very well with the local brethren of the coast who had moved in to the port of Jamaica. And then that passage, that one single paragraph written by Alexander Xwimelin, is concluded. It reads, quote, Morgan was made captain, and they went marauding along the coast of Campeche, where they captured several ships. End quote. This little sentence encompasses what is arguably the greatest raids that the Caribbean had seen since the time of Francis Drake, and what is most certainly the largest pirate fleet ever seen in the Caribbean, rivaling those of the Greek and Roman pirates and even the Barbary pirates. Now, sources do differ here on a few of the times of some of these raids, however. Reputable historians, people who are scholars on this period, disagree exactly on how many and when these raids occurred. Over the 18 months or so between late 1659 and early 1661. In truth, though, the Brethren of the Coast were so active from this port of Jamaica that it's almost impossible to expect them to have exact dates. You see, the Spanish kept their records, but the English only kept sparse records at best, so we know when they came back with huge amounts of money, but we don't know exactly how those correspond to what the Spanish were recording. However, I did my best to synthesize all of these sources down to make a sensible narrative that actually makes sense, and it goes something like this. In late 1659, Captain Ming led a series of raids on the Spanish Main. These are likely those raids that Captain Morgan and his compatriots earned their ships on, or perhaps used those ships on. However, Captain Ming did quite well. Now, when he got back to Jamaica, he sent a boat ashore asking the governor for letters of mark to make all this official. He did this, of course, after the fact, which was common practice at the time. These Jamaican officials were unbelievably corrupt. Now, he got these letters of Mark. However, when he came ashore, he had no money to send back to England. You see, Cromwell's protectorate operated much like Elizabeth's admirality had a few decades before. Men were welcome to pirate their way all across the seven seas, but the only way that they were allowed to do so by the English government is if they paid their dues back to the admiralty in London. Piracy was officially sanctioned as long as they didn't attack England or her allies and paid their share. But Captain Ming didn't do that. He blamed his men, the Brethren of the Coast, on why he didn't have any money, saying that they had taken all the money and divvied it up among themselves, but the governor there wasn't having any of it, so he was sent back to England to face trial. Oliver Cromwell certainly wasn't going to be happy about this. But instead of a stint there in the tower, or perhaps the hangman's noose he must have feared he faced, something much better awaited Ming when he got back to England. Oliver Cromwell, the usurper, had passed away. King Charles II had been restored to the throne of England, and the House of Stuart was back firmly in control. Now, King Charles had promised to return Jamaica to the King of Spain. However, the testimony of this vice-admiral of the Jamaica station really swayed him. He learned that this pirate, or what Charles might have considered this upstanding young gentleman, well, Jamaica was a profitable place, a place that King Charles would be wise to hold on to. It was something that was said to be a dagger pointed at the King of Spain's heart, as well as a really great moneymaker for the English throne. So, King Charles, instead of punishing Christopher Ming, sent him back to Jamaica. He sent him on a new flagship, a 46-gunner called the Centurion, which arrived in the spring of 1661. However, Captain Ming here wasn't the only surprise on board the vessel. The new governor, a man named Lord Windsor, descended the gangplank. General Doyley, who was the former governor, was replaced effective immediately. The port of Cagway, where they had been for years now, was renamed Port Royal. Also, the name of the fort, which had been Fort Cromwell, was changed to Fort Charles. And Captain Ming himself was to take over that role of admiral of the Jamaica station from William Goodson. And Christopher Ming had a lot of work to do. 
Historian Stefan Talti writes, quote, On September 21st, 1661, Morgan and the other adventurers were given a hero's send-off, with wives, whores, and merchants lining the shore to cheer the boys away. It was the middle of hurricane season, which runs from June to November, and the ships tacked to Negrel in Jamaica and then headed north for Cuba at three knots. End quote. Their goal was the former capital of Cuba, Santiago, which was on the southeastern side of the island, probably the closest major Spanish port to their home at Jamaica. Now, Captain Ming sailed the Centurion, which was the flagship. There were a host of other brethren vessels with him, though, including Captain Morgan and his friends. Just off the coast of Cuba, they encountered a friendly vessel, captained by none other than Oliver Cromwell's no-good playboy nephew, Sir Thomas Whetstone. Back in England, he had been uh, a man who liked to dice, chase after women, and spend as much money as he could get his hands on, but he had to run away from several of his creditors to the Caribbean to try and earn his fortune. So he was here with a ship full of natives and a few Africans, and only one or two other Englishmen on board, and the fleet of Christopher Mings was going to make use of him. You see, these natives and these Africans had quite a bit of intimate knowledge of the island of Cuba, so they had a council of war on board Mings' flagship, the Centurion. The harbor there at Santiago was guarded by an imposing castle, the Castillo de Moro, and her gun batteries were aimed squarely at the very small entrance into the harbor. So these buccaneers plotted. But while they discussed, they had even more vessels arrive, latecomers from Port Royal and even several vessels that were coming from Tortuga, swelling their numbers. So, they decided that the best place to land was about two miles down the coast, at a little village called Aguadores, on the mouth of the San Juan River. The locals there, there were only a few people living there, fled as soon as the brethren marched into town. So, for several hours, the brethren of the coast had their fill of all of the goods that they could have in town. And then, they went ahead and burned the entire village down. Behind them, the village was burning, which kept them warm through the night as they slept a peaceful night. However, in the morning, they got up and marched towards Santiago. Now, the locals had run to Santiago and warned them that there were a large number of English, Dutch, French buccaneers who were coming for Santiago, so they had time to prepare, but it still wasn't even nearly enough. You see... At the fort there in Santiago, the man who was in charge of the garrison was the same soldier who had been in charge of that guerrilla operation against the English in Jamaica. Now exactly what happened here is unclear. Perhaps he worked out a deal with the English, or perhaps he'd just learned his lesson and didn't want to fight these buccaneers anymore, or perhaps he was terrified. He had been unable to defeat the English any time in the past, so this man, this Spanish commander, turned and fled. Many of the soldiers that were manning the walls fled with him. The governor did show up and managed to rally what soldiers were left, but it wasn't nearly enough to stop the English. Within only a couple of hours of musket fire, they had taken the fort. They spent a total of five days ransacking the town of Santiago. They had their run of the town, taking anything, any women, any goods, any food, any drink that they cared to take for five whole days. And then, as they left one of the richest towns in the Caribbean, they found the gunpowder store in the fort, lit a fuse, and marched away. Seven hundred barrels of gunpowder blew up the fort and burned down the town of Santiago, which they said didn't recover for a full ten years. Back in Jamaica... They were seen as heroes. You can imagine that these men who had stolen thousands of pieces of eight were suddenly very rich and making all of the merchantmen, tavern keepers, and whores back in Jamaica extremely wealthy as well. Now that must have made all of these local merchants very happy, but the buccaneers and the brethren of the coast, as well as pirates all throughout history, are notoriously bad about keeping any money in their pockets. They spend it freely. But they also realize that they're going to need more very shortly, and their commanders know the same thing. Christopher Mings was eager to get back out there on the ocean. However, while they had been gone, their lord, Lord Windsor, had retired. And the new lord, the new governor of Jamaica, was a lot less willing to sign these letters of mark that would allow them to attack the Spanish settlements. 
However, it was on Christmas Day, 1661, that the new governor finally relented. According to Alexander Exquimelin, quote, The English celebrate Christmas with a great deal of eating and drinking, and at that season the masters let the slaves have whatever they ask for. End quote. This sounds, to me, quite a bit like the old pagan Roman tradition of Saturnalia. That's actually exactly what the Romans did, so perhaps that's how Captain Mings got the new governor to relent and sign the letters of mark that he needed to go attack the Spanish again. The day after Christmas, Ming began to assemble his fleet, made up of English vessels, Dutch marauders, some French Huguenot allies, and then the usual ragtag brethren of the coast from Tortuga. In all, more than 20 ships left Jamaica and were joined by several more en route. This was that fleet that was the largest pirate fleet ever seen in the Caribbean. Now, these weren't all massive warships, but they carried plenty of guns and were filled with men armed to the teeth and ready to do extreme violence. This was a fleet that would have made any Spanish city tremble. Even the great centers of power like Havana must have worried if they had gotten news of it. However, those islands had nothing to worry about. This fleet was headed to the west. It was actually the vice-admiral of the fleet, a man named Edward Mansvelt, who was captain of the Griffin, that saw their destination first. A place that we visited before, San Francisco de Campeche. That was the same place that Diego Lucifer attacked when he was a young man, and it's in fact even possible that Diego the Mulatto was here captain of one of these ships from Tortuga, one of these brethren pirate vessels, here to attack Campeche. You see, the men on this voyage had some knowledge of this part of the Spanish coast, and they suggested to the admiral, Admiral Mings, that he wait until nightfall and attack under cover of darkness, which is exactly what Diego the Mulatto had done. However, that wasn't something that a man like Mings thought was honorable. It's kind of funny, considering he's about to march into town and burn it to the ground, but he wanted to attack with his drums and his trumpets announcing their coming. Graham A. Thomas, in his book The Pirate King, gives a beautiful narrative. He says, quote, Mings attacked the town, his men only armed with pikes, swords, and pistols against the cannon. The fighting was intense. For almost an entire day they fought. The buccaneers had to take the stone houses one by one while being shot by Spanish snipers and soldiers. Shot whizzed around, bouncing off cobblestone, embedded into stone walls, tearing through clothing and ripping into flesh and bone. Men shouted as they attacked. Spanish soldiers were impaled by pikes. In close combat, men were cut down by pistol shot and swords. Shards of wood, stone, and metal flew in all directions from pistol and cannon shot. Mings was wounded three times, but by the end of the day, the buccaneers were successful. In the harbor, they captured 14 vessels. Crews were chosen to take them back to Port Royal. The Spanish counted their losses at 150,000 pieces of eight. End quote. That's a low-end estimate. The highest I've read translated into modern American dollars is that the buccaneers in Campeche stole $75 million worth of goods. Now, Captain Mings had been injured, and the man who took over the operation was his vice-admiral, that man Mansfelt. Mings would go on to retire shortly thereafter, go back to England, and lead a prosperous life with all of the money he had made in the Caribbean, and Mansfeld was to take over. Now, Alexander Exquimelin has a little blurb about Mansfeld that comes right after that passage we spent so much time looking at today. It reads, quote, At this time, there was in Jamaica an old buccaneer called Mansvelt, who planned to get a fleet together and raid the mainland. Seeing that Morgan was a young man with plenty of courage, the old buccaneer invited him to join the expedition and made him vice-admiral of his fleet. End quote. Now, if we were going to give that passage the same treatment that we gave the passage in this episode, it would take an entire episode to cover everything that was wrong with it. You see, it was a complete fabrication, and we know that because we know where Captain Morgan was. And in fact, that's exactly what we're going to do. Next time, we're going to take a long, hard look at exactly what Captain Morgan was doing on his 22-month-long first great raid against the Spanish. I'd like to thank everybody for listening, and I mean that. We hit a huge milestone this week. It snuck up on me. I didn't even see it coming, but I'd like to thank every single last one of you. We hit 100,000 downloads, and that's a huge number, way bigger than I expected to hit any time this soon. 
I'd also like to thank everybody that has been kind enough to support the show, either through Patreon or through PayPal, through the webpage. We wouldn't be here doing this without you guys. Anybody who has been kind enough to leave a rating or a review anywhere you listen to the show, you guys really help get the word out, and I appreciate everybody out there. You guys are really the best. These 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 are really the best.